Tiki Hut Media. From Minity Life Church, a multicultural United Methodist community of faith in Bradenton, Florida, this is Soul Ramblings Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Wicker. I'm the minister at Manatee Life. Today, we wrap up our series, Jesus Didn't Say That, with a common misconception. Uh, a lot of times, people will give you the advice that, you know, when you're going through a tough time, hey, don't worry about it. God won't give you more than you can handle. And that's what we're going to look at today as we head over to the sanctuary. Our scripture reading for the morning comes to us from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first one, the 10th chapter, first 13 verses. I invite you to hear these holy words. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing... He will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lord, today we recall your faithfulness. Thank you that you walk with us every day, that you are with us always. We proclaim that your promises are true and your goodness and love never fail. In this moment, we come to you and lay our lives before you. May we honor, worship, and adore you with every fiber of our being. Father, we proclaim that you are the Holy One, the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Your beauty and majesty are beyond compare. On this day, we join with all those who worship and confess you as Lord from generations past and present, and with all the angels that sing in heaven of your greatness and splendor. Lord, we adore you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we bow down and worship you. And, O Lord, in the silence of this moment, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives. Amen. We have been looking for the past three weeks, today is the third and final one, uh, at beliefs about Jesus and things that we might think that Jesus would be okay with for us to say and do. And he may have even said them himself, but actually Jesus never said that. For example, if you missed last week, we looked into the belief system that above all else, God just wants you to be happy. That's all God wants is for you to be happy. Today, we're going to look at what may be one of the biggest misbeliefs about God. Just a show of hands here. Anybody here ever had a bad day? <laughs> uh, I only see a few hands. Everybody else had. Did that bad day turn into a bad week? Yes. You ever had that bad week turn into a bad month? Yes. You ever had that bad month turn into a bad year? Yes. 
You see where I'm going. You see, when we look at life honestly, and we ask one another, and we talk to one another, and we see that there are times in the life of all of us when life just reaches a point where we get so beat down and discouraged, we don't know what direction to turn sometimes. You get to that place where you feel like, oh, I just, I just can't take this anymore. <clears throat> Along comes some well-meaning Christian with some annoying Christian-sounding advice. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. It's happened to me, and I've seen it happen. You're about to pull your hair out. You can't take it anymore. It's more than you can bear. And someone comes up and says, oh, oh, don't worry, don't worry. It'll be okay, it'll be okay. Whenever God closes a door, he opens a window. I don't know what that means. <laughs> what in the world does that mean? That is nowhere in Scripture. Open a window? Beth and I live in a third floor condo. Opening a window is not good news. I don't even know what it means, but they say it. Or they'll say something like, well, remember, remember, God helps those who help themselves. Yeah? Jesus never said that either, but that's another sermon. The one I want to deal with today is when people say, oh, don't worry, don't worry, it's going to be okay. Don't worry. Remember, God will never give you more than you can handle. It's going to be okay because God will never give you more than you can handle. That's in Scripture. Now, the intention to encourage someone going through a rough time is honorable. It's noble, and we should do that. I'm not saying don't encourage someone when they're going through a tough time. But we have got to realize that sometimes we twist Scripture around to say something that it doesn't. And we need to embrace the reality that when it comes to this phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle. Jesus never said that. That is nowhere in the Bible. The first issue with that is God won't give you more than you can handle. You've been through those bad times that we were talking about before. You're about to pull your hair out. It's more than you can bear. And somebody comes up and says, God won't give you more than you can handle. God, this is, you don't understand. This is more than I can handle. This is more than I can bear. We got a set of parents on our prayer list that we just added this morning for a one-year-old child dealing with things that a one-year-old child should not be able to deal with. That is more than those parents can bear. You're telling me God gave them that? No. No. That's the first thing. The other belief, the, where this belief comes from, is a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of the scripture passage we just read from 1 Corinthians 10.13. Paul was talking to the Corinthians about temptation. We're going to deal with that verse for just a few minutes. Paul said, God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, and I know, I know we're in church, you're moving on to perfection, you, we all get tempted. Everybody gets tempted, no matter who you are. We all get tempted. But here's the good news. God always provides a way out. You will not be tempted beyond what you can bear. Scripture never says God will not let you endure more than you can bear or give you more than you can handle. Beginning back up at verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 10, Paul writes of the Israelites under Moses, they all conform to the same outward action. They were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses, into the cloud and in the sea. 
They ate the same spiritual food. They drank the same spiritual drink from the same spiritual rock, which was Christ. But Paul explains in verses 5 and 6, he says this, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us so that we might not desire evil as they did. And these verses are central to the context of this entire passage. Paul wanted his readers to learn from the examples of the Israelites, not lust after evil things. And in verses 7 through 11, he goes on to list some of those evil things that they gave into and that tempted the people and caused them not to please God. Then in verse 12, Paul warns, So if you think you're standing, watch out that you do not fall. Proverbs says, pride cometh before the fall. If you think you got it, you think, oh, I won't give in to that temptation. Watch out. Watch out, Paul says. You're ripe for falling. Are we believers because... We know that we're spiritual superheroes or are we believers because we know that we're powerless and we need Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's point is. The temptation in verse 13 is not, as is commonly taught, trials and tribulations and troubles and these things that come upon us that are more than we can bear. No. The context clearly shows that Paul is talking about the temptation or the the enticement to do what is not pleasing to God. We as Christians are not tempted beyond what anyone else is tempted. We're tempted just as much as anybody else. God will not allow us to be tempted above what we are able. This is where many people make a mistake in understanding this entire passage. It can sound like it's saying that God won't give us more than we can handle, but Paul has just said that we have the same temptations as anyone else. Look around the world. Are the people of the world (coughs) handling these temptations well? Are they consistently resisting and not sinning? Absolutely not. The world is full of sin. What then does Paul mean when he says that God won't allow us to be tempted more than we're able? He explains it when he says, but with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. So who makes our way of escape when we're tempted? God does. It's not talking about our power to stand against temptation. Because we can't on our own. When we're tempted with something, without God, we cannot resist that temptation on our own power. We are powerless. We have to have Jesus Christ. Paul is saying that we, like every other human being, are tempted more than any of us can handle. But God has given us a way of escape. So, all right. So now we've settled that. 1 Corinthians 10.13 does not say God won't give you more than you can handle. But for those who do go through those bad days, those trials, those tribulations, those storms of life that are more than they can handle, what do we say to them? Because we need to be there to encourage them, to walk along beside them, I don't know who it is right now, whether in this sanctuary or watching us on YouTube this morning. I don't know who it is, but you feel like life has given you more than you can handle right now. There's something you wish God would do to change that situation, but he hasn't yet. And you're asking why, and you don't understand. You're probably saying something like, well, I've got to be strong. I've got to be strong. 
I got to be strong because I know God won't give me more than I can handle. I can get through this. And most days you feel like your whole world is resting on your shoulders, your burden. You try to carry the load, but you're too weak. It's crushing you, and yet you continue to fight and continue to fight, and it's getting harder and harder to try. But you have to. You have to be strong. You can't put down the load because if you put down the load, who is going to pick it up? Who's going to carry it? I've got to carry this. James wrote in James 5, 13, are any among you suffering? They should pray. James didn't say that if we pray, God was bound to remove us from our suffering. God might remove the suffering. He might not. We're to pray anyway. This is what Paul did in 2 Corinthians. If we go over to the next book in the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Listen, listen to Paul. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, listen to these words, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. He prayed repeatedly about a difficult situation in his life. He called it a thorn in his flesh asking the Lord to take it away from him. He asked three times, but God didn't. God responded with, my grace is sufficient for you. My power or my strength is made perfect in weakness. <clears throat> Hope awoke in Paul's heart when he realized that his situation was actually an avenue for him to experience God's strength, even though he was weak. You see, you don't have to put on a brave face. You don't have to pretend to be made of steel. The whole world doesn't rest on your shoulders. It shouldn't. You, God did not make you to be a pack mule. You're not God's pack mule. Release that burden to Him. Let Him carry that in His strength because you're weak and experience His strength within you. That's what Paul is saying. You just simply need to surrender your weaknesses to God in exchange for His power and His strength. God promised Paul that the power of Christ may dwell in me, or some translations say, rest on me. And that's a promise that is yours too. And an interesting way to view His power is by taking a look at that verse in the original Greek, that word rest or dwell actually means a tent or a covering. Christ's power over our circumstances and in our weaknesses is a shelter, a tent, a refuge from the storms of life. It is our protective covering. God's grace, His loving kindness, His joy, His strength. It was enough for Paul. It's enough for you. It's enough for me. When you began praying to God about your situation and you were asking for help, your circumstances probably didn't change right away. They might. They might not. But you will have a renewed sense of God's presence and power in your life. And you'll no longer feel alone. That's one of the greatest encouragements about the Christian faith. It's because... Even though our specifics may be different, we've gone through similar things. And we can share the love, mercy, grace, power of God, the strength of God that carried me through 
and it'll carry you through. Isn't that awesome? Through the help of others, we begin to see God's activity in our life. He has always been there offering help. We just got to swallow our pride. Let's call it what it is. It's our pride. If, if I don't carry it, who's going to carry it? That's pride. Swallow our pride and receive God's gift. And that's not all. Paul not only surrendered his struggles to God, but he had a positive attitude as well. He said, I will rather boast in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The only thing he's boasting in is his weakness. Looking for and acknowledging God's strength and our weakness is better than an attitude of grumbling because complaining, although it may feel good sometimes, it's a dead end. It's a dead end. Boasting in what God can do, boasting what God can do in us will cause us to depend on his strength more and more. His promise will become a reality in your life. For when you are weak, he is strong. In facing our struggles and fears, it's vital that we yield completely to God. Because when we do, God can use our burdens, again, as an avenue for his power, his strength, and his grace. The 23rd Psalm in the Revised Common Lectionary is the psalm reading for this week. And it's a very familiar passage. We've all heard the 23rd Psalm at some point in time in our lives. Even somebody who's never darkened the doorstep of a church has heard the 23rd Psalm. It reminds us of a bygone world of sheep and shepherds, of still waters and green pastures. It can be assuring. And as I was reading Psalm 23 this past week, a phrase stuck out to me. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, the psalmist said. Or at least that's the way I was taught to recite this psalm back when I was in Sunday school many, many years ago. But a look at the Hebrew reveals, as is so often in the Bible, that word follow can be translated a couple of different ways. That's the word that surprised me when I read, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You see, that word translated in the Hebrew, instead of follow, also means pursue. Pursue. Think about that. Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me all the days of my life. The Lord is my shepherd. We start out that 23rd Psalm with. And Jesus tells us about a shepherd who, when just one stupid sheep decides to wander off, leaves the 99, heads out into the wilderness, the shepherd does, and pursued the one lost sheep until he found it. The shepherd pursued until he found the lost. I lay down my life for the sheep, said Jesus. Is there no limit to God's pursuit of us? So, when we're in the midst of more than we can handle, pray. Be strengthened in God's power and realize that he is pursuing you with his goodness and his mercy in life and, as the psalm puts it, through the valley of the shadow of death, when we're in the midst of more than we can handle. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray.
Dear Lord, thank You that You are all we need. Today, we confess our weakness and surrender our situation to You. Fill us with Your power and grace. In Jesus' name, Amen. And now, receive this benediction. Let us go out. Inspire love. Embrace Jesus Christ. Engage the world. And tell somebody about Manatee Life Church. Go in peace. Amen. Wrapping up our series today on Jesus Didn't Say That, some things that we commonly believe that are in Scripture, but Jesus never said that. I invite you to be a part of our new series that we kick off here on Soul Ramblings next week and also over at Manatee Life Church. It's called Learning the Jesus Way of Life. And for this series, we're going to unpack what following Jesus is really all about. There are far too many people who think their relationship with God can be summarized by their church attendance record or a few minutes of quiet time in the morning. Or maybe that Jesus is just for the spiritual part of life and doesn't really have anything to do with the rest of life. Well, that could not be further from the truth. Jesus doesn't just want part of you. He wants all of you. That's why the earliest members of the Jesus movement were called followers of the way, because that's exactly what Jesus came to introduce, a new, more true way of life, a new way of seeing, of serving, of loving, of solving problems, of relating to people of doing the daily work of living life. In other words, following Jesus is an all-of-life way of life. It's a way defined by going where He goes, doing what He does, trusting what He says, and loving how He loves. Learning the Jesus way of life. We kick off that seven-week series next week on Soul Ramblings Podcast. Invite you to be here for that. You can join us over at Manatee Life Church live stream on YouTube every Sunday morning, beginning at 1030 Eastern Time. Got a link in the show notes of this episode. Also get social with us here at Soul Ramblings on Facebook and Instagram. Got links to those pages as well in the show notes. I want to thank you for the gift and privilege of your time today. It really means a lot to me that you are spending this time with us. And wherever you're listening to Soul Ramblings podcast today, be sure to click subscribe. That way you never miss a new episode when it comes out. Before we scoot out the door for this week, here is a last piece of advice. If you believe in goodness, and if you value the approval of God, fix your minds on whatever is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and praiseworthy. From Manatee Life Church, a multicultural United Methodist community of faith in Bradenton, Florida, I'm Jerry Wicker. I'll see you next week on Soul Ramblings Podcast. Until then, grace and peace. peace. Thanks for listening to Soul Ramblings with Jerry Wicker. Download new episodes every week. And if you haven't already, subscribe and be sure to leave us a rating and review. Soul Ramblings is a Tiki Hut Media production. Music.